go from back there. Okay. Start way back. Mm. Oh, is it on? Yeah. yeah. Oh, uh, like I was born in 1915, Fred was born in 1917, George was born in 1919, and I remember my uncle coming and he, to visit us. And he got this newspaper and he started to wrap him up. He said, we don't have any babies home. I'm going to take him. Oh, and I cried terribly. And I was screaming. I was four years old then. Then I remember in my rocking chair, the rocking chair, my, my mother getting my sister Florence and Alberta ready for school. So, so I had to be four and five then. And, uh, and then my uncle came to live with us and his wife. Uh, my mother's uh, sister. He was working down uh, Hog Island, uh, the, the, where they build ships down here. And I, I, I had uh, quite often I would wet the bed, and I slept so soundly. You know. So I remember him telling, "I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get some rats and make some rat soup. Maybe that'll do it." But I guess, uh, I guess by the time I was six, I was all right. And then I started the school, and I still remember my first grade teacher, Miss O'Neill. She used to come, my, my cheeks were rosy and plum, and she'd come and do that. And then I, uh, and then I, I don't remember a lot of things. I remember Miss Quigley, but I remember when I was about uh, 10, I uh, had my dad buy me a harmonica, a little marine band, and I learned to play it. And I remember going over and playing Heilige Nacht, Stille Nacht, to my grandfather and grandmother. And hey, they were so thrilled. I did, oh, you know how you play the one. And my grandfather says, Musiker, going to be Musiker, yeah. So, uh, and then I, in, then I, uh, of course, my, they always sent us to Sunday school. We had a, had a long walk up to it from way down there, a couple miles, I guess, to Sandy School. And uh, when, I was, uh, I, when I was around 10 or 11, we had this girl, uh, Sarah Hanson. She played a beautiful violin, and she would play at the service sometimes. And I fell in love with a violin. Yeah. And I pestered my mother and dad for a violin. I still have it. In fact, your mother had it all week in Israel. I think she paid seven dollars for it. It's called Old Ball. And she gave me, uh, she sent me for lessons. They cost seventy-five cents, which was high then. When you figure it's nineteen twenty-six, you know. And uh, I took violin lessons. And then a man by the name of George Caldwell came to the Sunday came to the church, and he formed an orchestra. And I was one of the dial violinists. My sister yeah. Alberta was the one banjo player, and Fred was taught how to play the drums at the time. And uh, I remember that very well, because I was always Richard. Oh, my my brother calls me George. Hi, Richard. Yeah. My mother would never allow me to be called anything but Richard. So George Caldwell, she was so thrilled about this guy coming in and taking over. He had to take charge after. Him. He called me Dick. And he's the first one to ever call me Dick, and she didn't, she didn't say anything. So I started getting the name Dick after that, you know, as a nickname for Richard. And who was this? This was the leader of the band, or the church band? Yeah, he, he, he led the, he, he was the leader of, of the band, yeah. And uh, he played piano, but he, uh, he led it, and he organized it, and let me see, I guess we uh, played there from, uh, I took lessons from 26 to about 28. So this, I graduated from grammar school in 1929, in June, in the eighth grade, and uh, started into West Philadelphia High School uh, that September. And I applied uh, for the orchestra. We had a big symphony orchestra, and I, I played first violin section in the symphony orchestra. For four, I was there four and a half years because we didn't have counselors and advisors in those days. So my, we came from an area where nobody went to high school or college or anything like that. My mother had 
nine years, but the, the same school. She did call high school, but she had it like a certificate. Was my mother was very sharp. But Alberta, uh, Florence, when when she graduated, my older sister, she sent her to West Philadelphia High School to take home economics. That's what the girls do. Alberta took home economics. I was sent in to what the best mechanic arts. We you know, work on lathes and mechanical drawing and wood lathes and metal lathes and machine shop and all that stuff. And I, uh, but I was playing first violin all through high school, and I didn't have enough credits. They used to graduate. You moved on every half semester, like nine A and nine B and nine M. I didn't have enough points to go from 9A to 9B. I only had two majors, English and science. So then I had to start taking those, and it pushed me back a half a year, see? so I went five, four and a half years. But I loved every minute of it. But by the time I uh, joined the uh, debating class, I guess I was in 11B, I noticed all my friends and uh, all the ones I associated with were all academic students. And I realized that, you know, I figured, well, I'd, I'd be a lawyer, but I, I, I'd have to go back and take all those courses in high school, and it was out of the question. So as far as college, but in the meantime, I, I bought a guitar and started playing guitar. I was something on the piano. My mother always had a piano. My mother read music, and we took, learned a lot of songs from her, and uh, I was enthralled with it. And I remember uh, applying for our senior uh, uh, assembly. Uh, I played something in, I think, some country song. May I sleep in your barn tonight, Mr. It is cold lying out on the ground. There was a lot of bums in those days, you know, roaming the country, you know. And, uh, but I wasn't selected as one of the entertainers. So I got this guitar and learned enough chords to play with it. And uh, when beer came back, I played violin and Fred played drums and this man played piano. But he only played a one key, uh, F sharp. So I was playing everything in C, so I just tuned my fiddle up a half a tone so it would be easy for me. So we were playing, we were getting $2 a night. Uh, that was after uh, Roosevelt had come in and they, uh, right before they, uh, rescinded that 18th Amendment. That's the Prohibition, right? The Prohibition, uh, the prohibition Law? Yeah. yeah. That was the Novo Experiment. And uh, so then, then I had my, uh, I, I graduated from high school in February of 1934. And uh, right after that, that uh, I had my appendix removed. And then I uh, went back playing again, and then I never sang. Now, like a lot of times my brother Fred would sing, he played the drums, he'd sing that. But I never sang because once you sing, then your mother and father want you to sing for everybody that comes, you know, and all that. But I started to do this on my own, learned to play the guitar and sing. And I bought these Gene Autry books and different ones, because I could read music and sight read it. And so I got the idea that all these tap rooms now, if I could go around, and I, ha I was so shy, nobody can believe it. I'd go and say, do you mind if I play in a few, uh, sing some songs for your people? And I said, yeah, I'll, I'll throw a quarter out, you know. Oh, the first night I came home with $21 in my heart. That was the end of my playing the violin for <laughs> Bar. So then uh, this one place over in Derby, he said, uh, if you'll come every Thursday, I'll give you two dollars if you come to 11 and sing. And I also got floor money. So I was there that night when uh, this fellow approached me and said, you ought to go on the SSO and fun. And I said, what's that? You know, it's a radio program. It's very popular. And all. I said, well, I don't know anything about it. He said, well, it's three of the guys that are working over the log cabin in Yaden. Ben Eckert and Frank Shannon and Ace Pankos and um, you know, why don't you go over and, and 
I'll, t go, I'll go with you in the future. So they asked me to sing and play, and they were quite elated and wanted me to uh, come in on the program as a guest. And, you know, non paid guest, you know. So I did, like two different times. And then there was internal friction on the program. And they, uh, they were all fired. I mean, all the people fired. So Frank Shannon, who was the engineer and the master of ceremonies, he was called the skipper. He had been a <coughs> captain in the uh, Navy in World War One. Yeah, uh, that was the end of the show. So I remember being home a couple weeks later, and I got a phone call. Mom, uh, woman, said, Dick, how would you like to be our new yodeling cabin boy? Because it was a mythical ship, see. Huh. And I said, well, you don't have any program anymore. He said, yeah, we're going to go back on the air. Well, I said, well, what happened to your cabin boy, Freddie Sanders? He said, well, he went over to WCAU, and well, they all deserted the ship, you know. So I went back on October 29th, 1934, as the, and I became a big radio star. <laughs> now, how old were you now? I was 19. 19? Yeah, I was just 19, yeah. I was 19 in September, and I went on the program October 29th. And it was a tremendous success, and you'll see all the, see all the write ups and everything. And it was during that time that uh, the following February, we used to sign, they used to, we used to sign autographs and pictures and all that. That I met your grandmother, uh, and uh, she was just 17. I think I, I met her four days after she was 17. Yeah. And she became enthralled with the program and she fell in love with Dick Goldhahn. I didn't know it. I didn't know it until years later when I read her diaries. Mm -hmm. you know. And she came in more and more and more. And the first thing you know, I had had a little puppy love affair with Clara Kelleher. But I knew I could never, because I was, I was of the mind growing up, I wasn't a woman's man. I was someone who I knew if I would marry and, and that's it. You know? And so I was, oh, I was so in, enthralled with this Clara Kelleher, but she was so strict and everything, I knew I could never live with that because I had stopped going to church when I was 17 and a half because I, I got to the point where I couldn't really believe what I was supposed to be teaching the children you know, and, and all the things in the church. And I figured, I'd, why be a hypocrite, you know? So uh, then I became interested in what people believe in, all religions. You mm -hmm. know? Instead of being a Methodist, I became a, a person who looked at somebody and saw a human being. I didn't see a Catholic, I didn't see a Jew, I didn't see a Muhammad, I didn't see a, we used to call them Mohammedans. And, uh, and that's how I, I look at the world today, you know? And, uh, Let me see, I was about to, yeah. And so I, uh, and then this love affair I had with, uh, I mean, in those days, it was no sex love affair or anything. Mm -hmm. It was just in trauma, you know, puppy love, you know. You're so thrilled, not because y your manhood told you you wanted more and all that sort of thing, but you, you just didn't do that. And uh, so I broke off with Clara Kelleher. Now, how long did you, like, see her for? I, I saw her for a couple months. And uh, and when I broke off with her, you know how you're a kid, you cry <gasps> and can't get your breath? <gasps> That's how I was for a couple of weeks. It was terrible. So I said, I'm never going to bother with any girls. I'm never going to. I mean, I'm too young to think about that, you know. I'll be 30 before I ever get married or something like that. But this Mickey McGarrigan got under my skin, and it got to the point where I was seeing her, seeing her. And I uh, took my mother down to visit her folks in Maryland. I took two weeks off from the program to, uh, to take my mother down. And I was writing to Mickey every day, and she was writing to me every day. In those days, the mails. She lived in Bywood. I lived with her grandfather. We'd get the mails every day, the next day. And so when it came, I was going to go down further. I had bought uh, my first Ford in 34. I got my license in in the February of 34. And I was going to go south further, but there was, my mother got par 
prepared to come home after a week. And so I remember saying to her, would you call Mickey McGarrigan for me? She said, what for? I said, tell her I'll be home. I'm not going down too far because there's a big outbreak of infantile paralysis down below. I only went far as Cape Charles, Virginia. So uh, I said, uh, she says, what do you mean? I said, well, when I come back, I want to have three or four days with her and, and not let the, the folks on the radio station know that I'm home. Because if they know I'm home, they'll be teed off if I don't come in to work, you know. So I want to be, she said, oh, is that how it is? I said, yeah, Mom. I said, I, I just want to be with her all the time. And I knew I was hooked, you know. And that was in, uh, I came back in uh, the end of, uh, the, uh, fir the first part of August, I guess. I mean, she has everything in her diary. But uh, took her to Atlantic City and took her to the Earl Theater. We saw all the shows and everything. And I remember in her diary, uh, she wrote, at first when I, when I started dating her, Dick kissed me. Then later on, Dick kissed me three times. <laughs> then later on, Dick told me he loved me. Oh, he liked me. I was very sweet. Then liked me. And she says, I'm crazy about him. In her diary, it's a scream. She's a typical teenager, you know. And she's 17 now, right? Uh, 17? She was 17. She was 17 when we married. Mm -hmm. She was 17 in February, and we got married December the 4th. She was still 17. And uh, I had just turned 20. I was uh, September 4th, I was 20, and we were married December 4th. And then for the next couple of years, we had a... Fabulous honeymoon type of life. And then one day she, uh, when I came, I was working nightclubs. And I'd come, she'd leave all her work to be her ironing and sewing, all the things to do, reading at night. So she'd be awake when I came home. So she was in bed, I'll never forget. And she, uh, I said, what are you doing awake, you know? And she put her arms up and she said, I want a baby, you know? I'll never forget. Well, it was roughly a, a year later that Dick arrived, you know. And that started a whole new life for us. A whole new life. Now, where, had you, where, where did you live after you got married? Oh, if we married, we lived in an apartment. We lived in 46th Street, and then we moved to 36 North uh, 60th Street, above market. And then that summer, I went to the shore. So we took all our stuff down to my mother's. And I came back from the shore, and then I went to for four weeks at the Bolton Hotel in Harrisburg, where I got room and board and for Mickey and I, and it was, you know, fabulous. And uh, came back from there, and I said, we ought to get our, our own apartment. And I looked at this apartment up at 40th Street, 430 South 40th Street, and uh, it was 3250. Oh, she said, we can't afford that, you know. I said, sure, I'm, I'm working, I'll, I'll be doing fine, I'm doing club dates and all. So I put a deposit down and we moved there. That's where we lived when Dick was born, 430 South 40th Street in Philadelphia. That's where you go on the subway now. Okay. And everything's going there. And, uh, and he was born in, in November. And then the following February, we just, I decided to move into a five-room duplex on the second floor, 58th Street. That was 3750, but we had to provide our own furniture, and so we went out and bought a lot of uh, second-hand furniture and all like that. We stayed there until 41, and this friend in show business of mine was going back to Hollywood, and he, uh, he was a Hollywood stuntman, and he said, I'm going to work for the Screen Actors Guild out there. He said, you know, with the, the way you play accordion and uh, guitar and sing, he said, boy, there's plenty of nightclubs out there. You could you could get work. And I, I'll get you in some some pictures as an extra and all that sort of thing. Those days it paid ten fifty a day for, uh, as an extra. And the, the average salary for show business was, you know, here, I was doing better, but the average salary was um, for six nights was... Uh, $30 a week, and then you gave the agent five, mm -hmm. so you ended up with 25 
Sure. Because the average income was 25 for, for, for in those days. My dad was making 24, I think, at the time. So we decided to do that. We put our furniture in storage. This is in early 41. And we went down and stayed with Mom and Dad, and we left the end of uh, July for Hollywood. And uh, in those days, you, you took auditions. You get an agent, you take auditions for the nightclubs and all. That's the idea. I took this uh, audition for Miss Curtis, a couple auditions. Now I took this one audition for a place called the Hollywood Tropics. It was right in the center of Hollywood, Sunset and Vine. And I'm playing the guitar and singing, and I always put a yodel. I, I sang all the popular songs. I mean, I wasn't doing country songs, popular songs. But I always had a, uh, threw in a yodel, like, i take a popular song, like, All I do is dream of you the whole night through. It's a love song. Second verse, I would jazz it up. All I do the whole night through is yodel o do 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 And it boy, made a big hit in the nightclub. But I only, they did one or two, you know. So I was doing that, and so this guy that owned the place, Mr. Arnheim, he said, do you know any cowboy songs? I said, yeah. And so I sang San Antonio Rose and Tumbly Tumbleweed or something. He said, I'll star you in my show, I'll put you in my show if you'll wear cowboy clothes. That's so how I became a singing cowboy, <laughs> 19, 1941. I started there the day after my birthday. Uh, my birthday was the 4th of September, I started on the 5th. And I broke all records there. They kept the shows two weeks. I was there 62 weeks, and the war came to Acre, and and then there was a lot of politics involved with the nightclubs and the service. Uh, if they put you out of bounds for servicemen, you may as well close up. Because, well, yeah, that was, I mean, you had half the servicemen. You had all the stars coming in there, no, that's all right. But, uh, so they, they put the tropics out of bounds for some reason. I think it was politics. And so I lost my job uh, a week before Diane was born. You know. And so a week later, I went to work for uh, Lou Costello. He had bought a, a place called The Bandbox. He was at the peak of his career, Abbott and Costello. I went to work for him a week after Diane was born. And... Uh, I, I worked in regular clothes, not cowboy clothes. And I played twin piano with George Tribble, and I played my act with the accordion. And then Maxine Lewis, who I'd worked with at the Tropics, had gone over to Las Vegas and gotten herself a position as a produce, producer of the shows in the Last Frontier Hotel. And she came in with a boss. He was a millionaire from Dallas. He's the one that really got, got the strip going, you know. Big sprawling place. What a fabulous Last Frontier Hotel. And um, they wanted me to come over there. I said, Who wants to go to Las Vegas? I mean, I, I drove through there. There's nothing there for me. So I think he offered me a hundred and a quarter a week. I was making fifty for uh, for Luke Stella. And so uh, I went over there and opened up. I think it was the 19th of uh, February, uh, 43. Mickey and um, Mickey and her mother. Her mother was living with us at the time. But she came out there to be with Mickey when she, Mickey was expecting Diane. So they came over, and I, I know Mickey got there for her birthday. And I remember singing Mickey to her, and she cried. I was a big hit in the show. And, and they set us up in a... First I was in a hotel room, and then they set us up in a, in a bungalow. He owned bungalows because he was trying to get people come there, you know. And then we were starting to get people coming. I remember Veronica Lake. She was a big fan of mine. Remember the, over the, the hair over there? She and Wallace Berry's wife, she was a much older woman, but Wallace, they came up with different ones. Like Mickey said, you sure she's not more than a fan? You know? <laughs> it was one of those things. You'd never have any idea. You, you can never tell about those things. There's a certain attraction, surely, uh, when you're entertaining and you find yourself doing things and trying to exude things, and you actually are flirting when you're entertaining, you know, in a certain sense, you know. 
it's like nowadays with these kids coming on, they're, they're selling sex, you know, and they're flirting and stirring everybody up, you know. But they were. And uh, so then uh, he decided to move us out to the Bar W Ranch, at a, a big ranch. And Mickey didn't like it out there. It was too isolated. It had a swimming pool and everything like that. And uh, so we moved back into town in the house. And then they started drafting fathers, uh, World War II. So I figured, wow, I better get my family back to Philadelphia because that's where my family is and her family is. Mm -hmm. So I'm hung up out here. So we came back, and I left. The, uh, we left Diane and, and Dick with my mother and dad, and we went to New York. We had never been on a honeymoon, so we went there for six days. In the meantime, we called up Ethel Chate, who was a big singing star. She had fallen in love with Mickey and I, and uh, she made us promise if I would get to New York to perform. So we did, and she was rehearsing a show at the time. Uh, this was in July of 1943. Uh, she was rehearsing a show with Willie Howard. Willie Howard was a famous Yiddish comedian from the old Yiddish uh, school. It was called My Dear Public. And we got there, she was so thrilled, and she introduced us to Willie, and then there was another fellow there who just started to become very prominent. His name was Milton Burrow. And I said, oh, we saw you at the Winter Garden last night, you know. And uh, so then Willie Howard said to me, well, what are you doing? I said, well, I'm waiting to go in the Army. He said, we have to work. I said, yeah, well, I live in Philadelphia. And he said, why don't you go up and see my agent, which was Frederick Brothers. So I went up to see his agent, and his agent wasn't there, Charlie, whatever it was. And they put me, uh, they had another fellow take, talk to me, his name was Jerry Rosen. And uh, he said, we have, a, we have a theater out in Brooklyn where we have show dates. We pay the full union scale, but you show, show yourself, see so what you can do. And I remember going out there, we came home and I got my clothes, got my cowboy clothes. But, oh, I had <clears throat> I had been to the because uh, <clears throat> I had been all those you know being a singing cowboy since '41, and uh, I walked out on that stage with my lonely accordion, not the one they're asking. <laughs> Mickey was there, and this guy hired me. Famous, world famous nightclub it was a Village Barn. 8th Street. They broadcast every night. Oh, well, yeah. And uh, he hired me as Master of Ceremonies and uh, he played my accordion and sing. And uh, it was all of it. There I was doing a broadcast uh, several nights. I forget how many nights a week I was broadcasting on the, on the network. And I came to the attention of a lot of you because they want you to sing their songs. Mm -hmm. You get performances. You know. So, uh, and then, I guess it was in, uh, later on after my birthday, I, I got my notice about the draft, going from uh, 3A to 1A. So these friends of mine said, well, why don't you, have, you, you can't quit work, why don't you write to your board, get in touch with your board and have them transfer your draft board over here. So I did, and which, which delayed my entrance, really, in a sense. So, uh, and then finally in December, I got my notice from the president that I was to be uh, examined for, you know, for induction. So the boss got uptight, so he hired somebody else, and so I left there. I had been there six months. And uh, we were in the apartment, and I got my first chance to record a music craft. It was a flat deal. I recorded these eight sides called American Cowboy Classics. And then uh, the next month, this publisher had me record eight of his songs. And then he sold them to this company, which came national, and they signed me to a contract. And the contract read, uh, in those days, uh, I guess it still is, 
union scale is you, you, can, you can record four songs in three hours. If it takes you longer than that, it, you, you're going to get overtime and all that stuff. So this publisher paid for the studios and paid for the musicians and had Johnny Fortis make the arrangements. And I went in the studio and recorded eight songs of his. Yeah, one of them was mine, but he published it. And, uh, and then he turned them over to National, and National signed me to a contract. They were going to pay me $200 a session, that's $50 a song, and they were going to pay all the expenses of the band and the studio and all that. That's how he came to uh, record for National, uh, National Records. And then the records were gobbled up because in those days the jukeboxes made your hit. Starry, the, the jukebox industry was a tremendous industry. Big organizations, all these, uh, one operator here might have a hundred jukeboxes. In them. They'd go around every week, collect the money, change the records, see, and they each had meters in them to see how many times the record was played and where they would get worn out and they would face them. That's how it came about that my records started to sell real big. And, and then, uh, so I recorded four more songs in the fall of 44 for them. And then I, I got my notice that I was scheduled to be inducted on February 13th. So we got eight more songs together, including Sioux City Sioux and I've Got a Gal in Laramie and some of those things. And honestly, and uh, I did a session on the 5th of February and the 6th of February. Mickey was right there with me. And then I was inducted on the 13th. The record didn't come out until the summer, my, my Sioux City Sioux record. Now what year was this? 1844, 1945. Yeah, because uh, I took my physical on the first day of, uh, I mean on the seventh day of April. I recorded these songs for the publisher on the first day of April of 44. And a week later I took my physical. So I figured I'd better get back here. So we got an apartment at 61st and Catherine. And I went into service, and I thought Mickey was going to be. I didn't know she was pregnant at the time with Billy. You know. Neither did she. So uh, she was in a bad way. I, I remember t she thought I was going to go and get killed, and life wasn't going to be worthwhile without me, and all that sort of thing. And I, I took a doctor. Doctor McDonald was a famous psychiatrist there. In those days, twenty-five dollars an hour was a lot of money, mm -hmm. and. Uh, and I went into service. Then my mother, then my mother uh, got in touch with a congressman, you know, like uh, how to make an application for a, a dependency discharge. And I was turned down, but uh, God bless her, she kept at it. And so I went down to Camp Blanding, and I went down there, and here was my records in the jukeboxes in the service club, and all around. You know, you never loved me, and broken heart, and all. And uh, this was February of uh, 1945. It was right after the Battle of the Bulge. My brother George went overseas in March. He was only in battle two weeks when he got hit. And um, so I did my training as a, and I and I received the expert infantry badge. I received a marksman with my rifle, with my M1 rifle, and. Um, all of a sudden, I was assigned to regimental headquarters, and I didn't realize it. Here, my discharge had been approved. It was in late, uh, late July. All my buddies in my outfit, they went over to Japan, because they dropped the bomb, you know, in, uh, around August 5th or somewhere. And uh, so all my buddies went over for mopping up exercises, you know, and, and running things, you know. So I was discharged on the 24th of, uh, uh, 24th of August and I called my mother collect on the phone and told her to arrange to be up at the apartment. Don't tell Mickey and the kids. Oh boy, when I walked in there, oh my God. Oh, Diane grabs me by the legs and took you. Oh, that was so good. To, you know. But in the meantime, Mickey spent those seven months becoming a very strong woman. You know, taking care of everything, 
take my kids to the doctor, take them to the store and all. And I got home and she was <laughs> quite ready, you know. And I'll never forget, it was just almost a, it was a little over a month after that that, that Billy was born. But in the meantime, I, uh, I went, when before he was, when her water broke, I took her up to Temple Hospital, that's where the doctor was. And uh, I stopped to pick up a billboard to see, you know, I kept abreast of what was, what was the, the most played jukeboxes and the best sellers and all that stuff. And I said, oh my God, they only listed the five. They used to, they used to look down their nose at country music, you know. They called it folk music then. And they only listed the five. They listed like 20 and 10 of the other ones, you know. So I said, look, the baby Boris luck. It was Dick Thomas, National Record 5007, Sioux City Sioux. God, I couldn't believe it. I said, it must be a mistake. So the next week I couldn't wait to get a billboard. I get it. I'm not in. The next week I get it. I'm in it. Top five again. And it kept moving up, kept moving up until I was, I was number one by, by November. And my records were in the top five from September of 45 until July of 1946. In the meantime, other records started to come out of Sioux City Sioux and everything. It was a real glorious thing. And uh, I opened up the office in September of uh, 45, the Schubert Building to publish. Spent a year of my life there. And then by the time, and it was on the hit parade for 14 consecutive weeks, it was a big thing. In those days, you could you could reach a consensus. The most played records on radio, net, network of television, uh, radio, television wasn't that big. Radio was a big thing. And the disc jockeys, the most played disc jockeys records, and the most played jukebox records, and the best-selling sheet music and the best-selling records, it all summed up to give you the top song. And that's when you became in the top ten of it. Lucky Strike Hit Parade. The top ten or top seven. Something. It was, it was, sometimes it was seven, sometimes it was ten. So Sue City said, oh, Mickey, I hit her drive. Oh, she wrote down every, oh, Sue City Sue is number five. Do you know? And she was all through it. And I was working and knocking my brains out. I wasn't paying much attention to that stuff. You know? I, I realize now more than I did then uh, how, how, how important it was. So, uh, and then I got a letter from Maxine Lewis. She said, uh, they have a six-day week in Las Vegas. She'd like to hire me back and made an offer. But I, did, I didn't pay much attention to it. And then I got a, a notice from uh, my, my agent that this Earl Kurtz agent in Chicago sent me there for $950 a week for four weeks. So uh, I, uh, I, I took the job. I, I bought a trailer. I bought a, a new car. And I bought a trailer, a hitch to it, so we put all our stuff in it, my accordion, my guitar, and all my clothing. And it was the three kids, and Dick and Diane and Billy. And we headed for Cal uh, we headed for Las Vegas. When I got there, I found out that AGVA was, uh, I was a member of AGVA too, but I, uh, I signed a, a contract. And uh, I didn't have any nights off. Because I was going to run down to LA and said, I said, no, I signed a contract. You told me it was six days. Now you tell me it's seven. So I really put up the case. My principal wouldn't allow me to do it. So they had to pay me that $150 extra. So I was making ten fifty a week for four weeks there. It was, it was a fabulous sum in those days. When you consider this, the value of money. You know. mm -hmm. And after I finished, that's when I, that's where I met Bugsy Siegel because my, the business, the people I was in business with, the lawyer, was a criminal lawyer from Minneapolis who defended all those mobsters like the Dewey mob. And that's how he knew Bugsy Siegel. When he heard I was going out to Las Vegas, he said, oh, you'll have to look up Benny Siegel. He said, don't call him Bugsy. And he said, uh, he's building a hotel there. I guess it's near where, where you're going to be. So uh, I go out there, and sure enough, they're, he's building a, they're building a place they're calling it the Flamingo Hotel. <clears throat> but it was built up. 
where ours was uh, owned two stories and spread out over acres. And uh, I remember at the desk saying, you know where I find Mr. Mr. Siegel? She said, yeah, he's up at the mezzanine writing a letter. So I go up and look at him, he's this handsome guy, cold, blue eyes, handsome guy. I said, Mr. Siegel, he looks up, he says, yeah. I said, my name's Dick Thomas. I said, um, I was told to send best regards from Al Green and Archie Carey. Archie? I said, yeah, I'm in business with him. Well, he's, I think he watched every show I did. He was building that. He had his girlfriend there, Virginia, and all that. Well, you know, that's another story. That's the reason that that movie's such a bunch of bullshit. You know, that uh, Bugsy movie. You know. It has everything all screwed up. It had Bugsy being a visionary. He built Los Angeles. He didn't build. They showed. They showed a, a stretch of desert. That's the way it was. Be oh, what went bull? <laughs> Las Vegas was in full bloom before the mob ever said it. They don't make things. They come in you know, after it started. But anyhow, and I, after we finished there, I went down. That was a fascinating four weeks. Finished that. And we went down to Hollywood t for two weeks, and I made some appearances down there with some radio stations, Gene Autry and. And uh, came home, and uh, we got home in January of '47, I guess it was. And I started working around here again, nightclubs, and then the show business. Was you had to go farther and farther. You had to go to Williamsport. You had to go to Syracuse. You had to go, and, uh, and then I was booked uh, in 1950. I was booked like three weeks in uh, Detroit. And every night I'd call Mickey and I want to talk to Daddy. Dick said, Diane, I want to talk to Daddy. And between my hotel bills and my phone bills and my airplane fares and my agents commission, you know, it got to me. And so when I had a chance to, uh, so so it was in the early fifties, in '54, this guy, this agent kept calling me. I was in New York a lot to to work in. in in a lounge, Astor Hotel lounge here. And I said, he said, what time were you? Well, you do a half hour, you alternate with somebody else. And I said, oh, hell, I don't know enough songs. He said, the hell you don't. He said, I, I booked you at the Willow Grove Moose and I saw you out there in an hour and a half, people yelling for numbers and you were doing them. So anyhow, he, he talked me into finishing this guy's comp. They had an accordionist there that they didn't like. So I finished his last eight days so I'd get up with the accordion and go out in front of the piano, but you had to remember everything you were doing. So one night, I'll never forget, I, uh, it was slow, it was my last set, like at one o'clock, and I sort of slid up on the piano and started playing. And the manager said, I didn't know you played piano. I said, yeah, a little bit, you know. Then I figured, hey, I could have music right up in front of me. People ask for numbers, I don't know how I can get them, buy them, and bring them in. And I won't have to remember. So that's why I have so many hundreds of copies of music. You know. I accommodated people. I did everything I could to accommodate them. And I built up a big following as a, probably the night, the, the, the top uh, lounge entertainer in Philadelphia, you know, uh, between 1955 and 1986. You know. and, and those years went so fast, too. Uh, here, uh, that was 55. And then 57, I, I went on television to Channel 10 with Gene, Gene Crane. We had a program called Top of the Morning every morning at 9. I was on there a couple of years, and uh, that's when Ronnie was born. And three weeks after Ronnie was born, Gene Crane had a son born. And his name, David Lincoln. So David Crane is probably a very wealthy guy today. He's three weeks, three weeks younger than Ronnie. He's a co-producer, co-writer of Friends, a television show. Mm. I'm not familiar with, but it's a big hit. And uh, I'll never forget that. So uh, that was 47. Then I went back into uh, lounge work uh, off and on. I only worked a few places, like the Astor Hotel Lounge. And then. Uh, the old Heidelberg room in 1959, and then I went to Kenny's Suburban House for a couple of years, and I went back to the Heidelberg room 
Uh, so it's only about six, six or seven places I worked in all those thirty years mm -hmm. as an Allen's entertainer, because uh, I was always, you know, didn't have any trouble getting work. Where I know it, it's rough. Uh, I had the tools. I was able to play, sing, chat, and do all that stuff, you know, because my experience as master of ceremonies was a film thing. So that's how it came about, and I was doing that until your grandmother. Uh, 1985 we had the big uh, the kids gave us a big bash for our 50th wedding anniversary in December and it was that New Year's Eve that she came into the club with me the Casa Vecchia and she complained the next day because she was dancing around about her leg so I said if it keeps spotting you're going to have to see about that so finally uh, a couple months later we I took her down to Fox and she says I think she might have uh, Flebitis, so he sent her in for a venogram, and I'm sure she did. And then he, uh, so then I s said to him after, you know, what should we do? He said, well, if you can keep her off her feet, you know, it'd be good. I said, I can't keep her off her feet. He said, well, then we'll have to put her in the hospital. I said, I think that's the best idea. Boy, I'm glad we did it. With all the tests, this one doctor especially went through, couldn't find out why a healthy woman like that would have that. There must be some reason. So they finally took tests and tests and tests, finally ended up with CAT scan. And here it showed nodes. And, uh, and, uh, and the result came down that uh, the best thing to do was surgery. And I know Dick got involved in it. It was five five uh, pathologists there, a radiologist. Four of them gave one count, and one, this one woman, Dr. Hamilton, she said, no, she I send her home, to come back in a month or two and see how they, and the, my doctor was enraged. So I finally, we finally compromised, and I went and got the uh, CAT scan and drove him up to Abington and let Dick's Radiologist. As soon as he saw me, he said, "If that were my mother, I'd have surgery." Here they found this uh, ovarian cancer business, mm -hmm. and, and then for the next three and a half years, we had a lot of fun, and she, she went through. But she had most of her discomfort with um, with the vertebra, the, the fractures of her vertebra, because of her osteoporosis. You know. And of course, you know the rest of the history about your grandmother. She died on the 10th of September, 1989, and I've been living here ever since with all her wonderful memories. And of course, I uh, I stopped working then. So let me see. I was 65 in 1980. So in '86, I was uh, 71. So I, I never got back. Uh, I wasn't in, in that good a shape to get back in it. I, I love my work. I love what I did. But uh, so my my entertaining career runs from 1933 until about 1987. You know. and, uh, and, uh, and then uh, a year after she died, I start falling apart. I had my eye go out. Macular degeneration in the left eye. Ninety-two, I had a, another hernia operation at the hospital. Nineteen ninety-three, I was stricken with what they call myasthenia gravis, which is a disease here where your body builds up antibodies against its own nerves and muscles, and it can be very fatal. You know. The way it affected me, it affected my eye, eyelid. I couldn't open it, and then it got worse with it. So I finally in ninety. Right before your wedding, I had eye surgery, remember? The eyelid surgery? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I remember that uh, Dr. Bedrosian saying, don't drink any alcoholic beverages for 10 days at least. So I, uh, you went and said, hell, there's no way I'm not going to drink a drink here at Walmart's wedding. You know? It didn't hurt me. It was only five days later. Then in uh, November, I had to have the operation again on the eyes. So, so far, they've been staying open. 
Now my brother George has that problem. Mm. And, and that's a funny thing. So that's my uh, that's my story. That's my life. And, and yeah, just sketchy. But we had a lot of wonderful days in between, as you know. Uh, she lost all her hair during chemotherapy. Then it grew back beautifully. Gold, uh, white hair. And uh, it was only the last month that she really suffered, you know. Mm. So we had over three years, uh, three and a half years uh, with her. You know, we went to a lot of places and we used to go eating with John and Alberta and we over at your place and uh, Diane and Steve, you know, she thought that deck was the greatest thing in the world. And of course, Steve had um, Steve had bought the house in uh, Vassar Street there, and uh, and then Ron had moved in with him. So four of our kids were over in Jersey, and Dick was up in Bucks County. That's the way it's been ever since. So then my problems, my physical problems, started. Uh, uh, multiply and and my uh, legs and my knees and my heart condition and all that stuff and here I am you know an old um, shriveled up uh, guy uh, I used to I used to see these old men with their with their arms and it's all dried up where mine used to be very muscular I'm watching myself do that it's, very fascinating. It's uh, interesting, but that's the way life is. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the way it's supposed to be. I always said that when I was young. Said, We're born by the rules of nature, the laws of nature. We live by the laws of nature. If you don't believe the laws of nature, go up on the roof and jump off and see what happens. Of course, the laws of nature says gradually, gravity will bring you down and, and do you out. You know. And so we live by the laws of nature and we're affected by all the various laws, whether it's a virus or whether it's a uh, bacteria or whatever it is. And we die by the laws of nature. You know, that's the way it goes. And so I've always faced it. I've always uh, realized mortality and all that. Uh, a lot of people, um, a lot of people are very scared of uh, ending their life and all that sort of thing. I know Mrs. McGarrick, she's a very religious woman, and uh, she was always afraid of dying. But then in her last few days, she was serene, you know. Mm -hmm. But uh, she was very, very devoted to her religion. And uh, But here I am with, uh, I, I don't belong to any organized religion. And uh, I, I feel I feel at peace with myself. Looking back on my life, I, uh, I'm very pleased. Oh, if I could live over again, a, a few changes I'd make, especially in the business end of it, you know. But I would still do the same thing over. I still fall in love with Mickey McGarrigan. Mm -hmm. I still make that choice to get off the road and stop reaching for the gold ring stay home, I'd be home every day with my wife and children. I'm glad I did that. So a lot, a lot of people, I know a lot of people look back on their life with a lot of regret. I, I know I talk to people all the time. A neighbor of mine, I, I was talking to him the other day. Now he just retired a few months ago. Now he's over the rest, about six months ago. He's over the rest now. I lent him a couple books to read, Bill Cosby books. He didn't know that I guess he never followed Bill Cosby. He didn't know how how humorous he was and how clever. And he was telling me that now he's bored. And I'm telling him about my life and about uh, you know about my kids. I said if, if it weren't for my uh, daughter Sue and my uh, son Dick, I said I wouldn't be able to stay here because the others are busy with their families. And, then he goes in to start regret. He said, I should have brought my mother here. She ended up in a, in a home and she didn't like it there. And all. He said, but I wasn't able to take care. I said, well, you, you're, you were unable to do it. You would have done it if you, but he has a certain amount of regret and guilt and all that stuff. I 
said, you must, you must figure that out. You know? A lot of people rationalize and say, well, I couldn't do it because of this, I couldn't do it because of that. I did it for my mother and father. My kids are doing it for me, you know. So uh, looking back upon my life, I'm, I'm at peace with myself. And uh, I'm very, I was blessed by a wonderful girl who blessed me with six wonderful children, who blessed my whole life. And then this, this CD they brought out of Germany of, of some of my songs just started to take me back in memory. It's just, it's been a joyful reunion of old reminiscings, you know. Just, uh, um, so that's, that's the way I am now, uh, Walter. Well, thanks, Grandpa. And I'm very proud of you, and I'm very proud of Noel, and I'm very proud of David. Because your mother did a hell of a job with the three of you. Mm -hmm. She really did. Encourage him. I always encourage my children to get their education first. You know? Of course, uh, I made sure that they all studied music and they, they do as they please uh, on that score. But uh, I didn't want them to be musicians or anything like that. It was, a, you know, I, and I we always we always sent them sent them to a non. Uh, the non-sectarian union up here, Union Chapel, um, and then to the church up here. But I felt that uh, the Bible had uh, affected history so much that they should at least uh, have some knowledge of it. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that's why I did it. Not to push them into any religion or anything like that. Because Mickey and I, she was raised strict Roman Catholic and uh, we were married by a magistrate. Now where were you married? Where was, where was the We were married in a magistrate court in Philadelphia somewhere. Okay. I, don't, I, don't, I don't know where it was now. I guess they moved it, you know. Uh, and my mother and Mickey's sister stood up with it. Yeah, we were married. I remember that. Did you have a dinner afterwards or did you go out? Mrs. McGarrigan. I believe it was way to go. But uh, we, we evolved along those lines and we never, even though I'm still probably on the uh, list of the Methodist Church and she's on the list of the Catholic Church, we don't belong to any organized church, you know. We go to church for this one or synagogue for that one or whatever it is. And it's, it doesn't make any difference to me. You know? But uh, there's certain things it affect your living in a certain uh, I remember uh, growing up with the Ten Commandments and I remember the one that impressed me was honor thy father and thy mother that thy days may be long upon the earth that they Lord thy God give it thee you know and uh, I did I did I told my mother and father before I got married as long as I have two arms and two legs in my health I'll see that you're taken care of did that. You know. It looks like Dick and Sue are on the same same scale. You know. Wonderful people. I mean, they're all wonderful, understand, but your mother is such a caring angel, and Dick is so concerned about me. And of course, we built up a long relationship. Uh, I was always very bonded to Dick, even as a school kid. And high school kid, we'd sit and talk for hours. New York with me. I did the same thing with Steve and all, you know. But Steve, you have to keep drawing out. He doesn't volunteer anything. Mm -hmm. You have to keep asking him questions, you know. Everybody's made differently, Walt. And uh, I think his two boys are like that. You have to keep drawing them out. They don't volunteer stuff. They're talking more and more now than they used to when I was over there a couple weeks ago. I was asking uh, Michael about his drums playing and what the band, what the orchestra consisted of, and he was telling me. And uh, like, and uh, I was talking to Kevin about his uh, 
guitar playing and uh, you're learning your instrument and all that sort of thing. Because I have found that I, I learned enough to play for myself. I never became a good musician on the guitar. Violin I did. I played all the classics and everything, but and the accordion. But on piano, I'm self-taught. I improvise my bass. I I used it for. But when I when I when I hear some of these records and these musicians that played for me, boy, they could read. They put a put a best of music up and go one two boom they play it. Now these ones in Nashville that I went in '47, most of them couldn't read, but they had an innate ability to offer and, and play the right things to come in shade. You notice how the shading is in some of those things. And the steel guitar comes in, when the voice comes in, it slips out, you know. And they, they just had a natural ability. These other guys were superb musicians. One of the ones I made for National. And uh, yeah, some of those records, you'd think it was Benny Goodman playing the clarinet. Mm -hmm. you know? yeah. Cy Baker on trumpet. They were all top musicians. Joe Viviano was one of the top accordionists in the nation. So I figured, look, in those days you were paying forty-one twenty-five a session. That's for three hours. Why not get the best? So that's what we did. And Johnny Fortis would write the arrangements. And those, and we did a play. And but just those few instruments sounded like more a lot of times. And we had the accordion, we had the bass fiddle, and the guitar. Then we had a violin, and we had a trumpet, and then we added a clarinet later. Sessions, double sessions. So with five or six uh, men, it sounded like a bigger group, really, the way he voiced the instruments in there, you know. And, uh, fascinating life, Walter. <laughs> fascinating. And uh, as I went through life and I got uh, into lounge work and everything, people would hear that I, I made some movie shorts and I did this and I. Oh, I didn't know you did that. You never brag about that. I said, the only thing I brag about is my wife. <laughs> you know? I don't brag about anything. It's in the past. You know? Yesterday is history. Tomorrow is a mystery. Today is a gift. That's why we call it the present. Right? Yeah. <laughs> my mother left a poem with each one of us in a letter before she died. She was so organized. Your mom did? My mother, yeah, your great-grandmother. And uh, anonymous composer, they don't know who did, but if I remember, it goes like, uh, the clock of life, you know, you, know, you wind these clocks, we used to wind them up, and you have electric clocks now. You wind them up and they run out after 12 hours. Run. The clock of life is wound but once. And no man has the power to know just when the hands will stop at late or early hour. Now is the only time you own. So live, love, toil with a will, have no faith in tomorrow for the hands may then be still. You know? and, and a lot of people live their life as if they're going to live forever. You know, it's like some of these people become famous and they think, oh, it's going to last forever. I, I was a good friend of Bill Haley, and that's what happened. And, oh, he was making all this money. They were all buying Cadillacs and everything. So he ends up with the IRS and uh, in trouble. And in fact, he ended up living in Mexico, I think. Had a big, big break because he wasn't a real talented guy. I remember buying his dinner for him way back in the 40s. Yeah. And then, of course, uh, Frank Sinatra was born three months after I was born. He was born on the 12th of uh, December, 1915. He started out around the same time as I did. And uh, I remember uh, when I was at the tropics, we had a show every week called The, the Lamplighter Show. Uh, it was a network show, and uh, we'd have different famous guests on. Tommy Defford, Glenn Miller, 
Paul Whiteman, we had Frank Sinatra. In my scrapbook shows pictures of Dick Thomas and Frank Sinatra, a little skinny kid. You know. And that he had just left Tommy Dorsey. It was in uh, 1942, I guess it was uh, September. Frank Sinatra became one of the most famous singers and entertainers, and actors in, in the century. But he didn't become the success that I did as a father and as a husband, right? Mm -hmm. But I, I made that choice to do that. And to me, that was the important thing. I think that legacy carries on further, though, in you know, in subsequent generations. Uh -huh. That that legacy lives on. You know, making that decision and oh, yeah, you may your name that may not be a household name, but oh yeah, that's right, yeah. And that's why it's um, it's very interesting to see some of the observations on this CD biography. They say something there that. It's a shame that he didn't get the fame that he deserved and all that sort of thing, you know. I must have had a lot of fans over there in Germany and finally. They must have been yodel freaks. They used to like the yodel. <laughs> the the Alpines, Alps, the Alps, Alps there, yeah. You know, yeah, like that, you know. So, so much that I don't know where they got the information. Most of that information is so true. The only thing wrong about it is that, that Dick Thomas up, up in, in Canada. Uh, British Columbia, yeah. which is a Another story. <laughs> he took that name after I became well known, and uh, I guess he took bookings. Uh, maybe his name was Richard Thomas. I don't know. That's funny. But uh, <laughs> how they got all the information, the years I recorded them, when they were released, what they were, who wrote them. They did a lot of research or knew a lot about it. So it just it just boggles my mind. You know, it just. Uh, I told Dick it, it brought me a lot of uh, joy and just reminiscing about all those things, you know. And Dick said, when you can look back on your life, Dad, and uh, feel the way you do, he said, you're a very fortunate man. I said, I was very blessed. Yeah. Not too many people can say that. Yeah, that's what Dick said. Because mm -hmm. uh, I, I see it in my own life with so many people. There's so much regret in, in, uh, in, in their life. And because you have to think of that as you go along. You know? If you have principles, uh, adhere to them, you know? even though it hurts. When I, my contract w was not renewed with Decca Records after three years. Because when I wrote, the, wrote into the contract, when I signed with them, I had put the same things in as I did with National. They paid me uh, a penny and a half. I was getting a half a penny in National. They paid me a penny and a half a record, and they're supposed to pay for the <coughs> uh, studios, the musicians, and everything. And, and then when I got these, kept getting these, oh, how come I'm not getting, they're deducting this, they're deducting here they were deducting for the musicians, and I was a musician too, so they were deducting for that. And I went to them and said, my contract says that you're to pay for the musicians and the studios and things like that. When I went to Nashville, they paid, they're supposed to pay for my transportation there. They sent me there, you know, so the hotels and everything like that. So then they, uh, there was discussion about that, and they took it down to their law department, and they found out that I was right. But it was a slap in the face for them, because it amounted to about seven or eight hundred dollars. Mm. And way back in 1950, that was a lot of money. And so therefore, we didn't renew. So from 1950 to 55, I, I freelanced. I recorded for about five or six companies, you know. But uh, I figure a deal is a deal. You know? you know, if I lend somebody money, I expect to be returned. If I give it to them, I don't expect it. Mm -hmm. you know? I mean, this happened here in the neighborhood. You know? I said, no, I can't lend you any money. But here, take this. And putting the form out there and feeding the kids and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. 
dysfunctional families and all, you know. A deal is a deal, Walter. <laughs> yeah. And uh, Ronnie used to break up, even when I said now. We'd get talking something at, at the dinner table or something. Mickey would say that. I said, don't say that. I said, don't give me that stuff, Mick. I can beat you any day in a week. Come on, stand up. Fight like a man. You know? She would laugh, so she would tears. And Ronnie would break up. You know? <laughs> yeah. I she, got, she got to know my sense of humor. And what a woman. How you embarrassed her. I remember her saying a lot. Oh, Dick, you know. Huh? And you would, would say things to maybe even embarrass her a little bit, but she would laugh and say, oh, oh Dick. Oh, yeah. yeah. A lot of times she would try to act that, oh, that's terrible. Like, uh, even as late as, uh, you know, like the early 80s, uh, at the Council of Figures, how the piano bar was there. She'd be sitting there, and uh, I'd be entertaining her. I would sing and flirt with her. Nobody else would know it. And, you know, tears would come when I would sing her <laughs> song, or sing Mickey. Now, remember one night, these uh, people go in and say, hey, uh, you, you, some of your kids went in, and I... I I understand uh, your oldest son's a doctor. I said, "Oh yeah, Dick Jr. is a doctor." I said, uh, "See, I had him by my by my first wife, but I live with Mickey now." And 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 she said, "Yeah." She came. And said, you shouldn't say. They'll, they'll think I'm a bitch. I say, "You are, Mickey. Just stay that way." You know? <laughs> she was my personal one. Yeah. And uh, well, she would try to act like uh, as if she was who you know. Embarrassed or something, you know, mm -hmm. but uh, yeah. You had a wonderful grandmother. Stops and the music comes in, it's still the same level. I said, it shouldn't be that way. It should be a little behind your voice, and then when you stop singing, it should come out. Mm -hmm. You know, it gives it a big kick. And the kids, they, they, they listen to the rock and roll records today, and, and they, I guess, imitate them, all these little groups and all like that. And, and, uh, and they go to these studios, they're not real good at, why do you think they pay these producers of, of records, the guys know how to balance it? They pay a lot of money, mm -hmm. they, they know what they're doing, you know. They get the best out of the music and the voice and everything. But even I watch on television, you know, that's a different story that you don't have that balance. Because a lot of times on television, the music's so loud you can hardly hear the voice, you know. But, uh, it's a different world today, in other words. It's a totally different world. Hmm. Yeah. Now you have the. Uh, I wouldn't know how to go about, as I told uh, Diane with, with Stevie. I said, like our Stevie said, well, what, you, what is he trying to sell? Is he trying to sell his voice? Or is he trying to sell a song? Or is he trying to sell a CD? You have to determine what, the, what, you're, what you're trying to sell. Mm -hmm. And then wherever the market is, you have to go. Like I said, if Steve Owens is in financial uh, planning, I said, if he goes in the ghetto here, he's wasting his time. That's not the market. Mm -hmm. But if he's selling dope and he goes in the ghetto, he'll make a fortune. So you have to go where the market is. Mm -hmm. And that's why so many of them, uh, if you read the history of them, I don't care whether it's Willie Nelson or who, moving into Nashville and taking years and years of struggle and flipping hamburgers and McDonald's and all that sort of thing. And same thing with actors going to New York. But for everyone who makes it, there's 10,000 that don't make it. Right. It's like the lottery. You know? But you can't sit on your fanny and accept somebody to, to do it. Mm -hmm. You just can't do it. It doesn't work that way. Now and then somebody young will come along and make a hit all of a sudden like this little uh, girl that was only 14 when she, uh, about five years ago, I think what her name is. Don't hear too much of her now, but, uh, and then, uh, what was that Cyrus uh, guy that made the heartbreak of? Billy Cyrus? No, uh, what was it? Garth Brooks. Huh? Billy Cyrus or Garth Brooks? Cyrus. What was his name? Billy Cyrus? Was it Billy? Maybe uh, not. I'm not sure. He had a smash hit. Everybody. 
And I haven't heard much of him. Or, I mean, mm -hmm. But a guy like Garth Brooks, he, uh, between his concerts and his recordings and everything, he's become a, a super seller. But today it's all albums. Mm -hmm. See, when I grew up, it was all singles. Mm -hmm. If you didn't have a single, you weren't anything. Now, you put out albums. Like in 79, uh, they put out this album of Willie Nelson, Went for the Road. But they put out a single of, of uh, Willie with Heartbreak Hotel and Sioux City Sioux. And you, it, it revived the whole thing in 79. Mm -hmm. When Diane and Steve were coming back, that's all they heard coming from <laughs> the country. Yeah. yeah. Huh. So, uh, but every now and then you'll, they'll take an old song. And Willie Nelson continued to do that. Mm -hmm. He recorded all those old songs that he had hit records on Stardust and Blue Skies and September Song and all those. Then he started recording with this one and that one. He did the same thing as Sinatra did. And Willie, uh, but Willie plays that acoustic guitar, but a jazz, a country jazz type. I mean, it, it's one of those, he has that feel. He doesn't have a great voice, he has a nasal type of voice. I mean, I like the way he delivers the lyrics. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Heard one of his records the other day on uh, WPEN. I think it was a September song. Doesn't, he doesn't have the voice to make it all fancy. A lot of singers want to show you how good they can sing by hitting the notes and all that sort of thing. He just sings the plain song, and uh, that's his style, and he became very famous. first one come along was when I was growing up was a Bing Crosby. Yeah. He had such a fabulous range and he introduced a new sound like a cooning sound. And he could had such great control over his voice on the low notes and the high notes. And all, all the ones after that were influenced by him. You know, Dick Haynes and the Frank Sinatra's and Tony Bennett's and all. But uh, he was the he was the originator of that uh, type of thing, and they all did well, too. They all admitted that they took a cue from him. Because mm -hmm. you, you're always influenced by predecessors, you know, and uh, people that, uh, it's just like, if you read history, you're influenced by some of the things they say. I never, <clears throat> I never uh, appreciated, I got a book on Einstein about a year before he was, he died. I never appreciated him. I knew he was a great scientist, but I never realized what a human being he was. Mm -hmm. What a compassionate, what a, what a fabulous human being. You know? And uh, there's this, um, and there's singers that I, I discovered too late that I didn't really appreciate. What's this guy that sings real high, plays guitar? Did Pretty Woman? You know who I mean? Roy Orbison. Roy Orbison. Oh, he's, he was fabulous. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't appreciate him until a couple years before he died. Yeah, and I see some of his shows on public television now, and, and this guy uh, had a very unusual type of voice. Yeah, yeah. So, Walter, whatever you do, do it as best you can. <laughs> they plan to. <laughs> <laughs> You're doing fine. Well, I guess you, your gang's ready to go. Right? <laughs> I'll check on.